Crank up the volume and get ready for real-world bird hunting by listening to the Wingman Podcast by Eastman's. Now your host, Todd Helms. <laughs> All right, hey guys. Uh, another episode of the Wingman Podcast here by Eastman's. And today's guest is Dan Rooster Levins. Mm, if you guys are fly fishermen as well as bird hunters, Wing shooters, you know that name because Dan is the owner of the Stonefly Inn over in uh, Twin Bridges, Stonefly Outfitters, I'm sorry, over in Twin Bridges, Montana. And But he's also a heck of a bird hunter and likes to run all over Montana and anywhere else with his dogs and a shotgun in hand in the fall. And uh, Rooster, thanks for jumping on, man. I really appreciate your time. Hey, thanks for having me, Todd. This yeah. is, uh, you know, a guy's got to do something in March to pass the time. Right, right. Is the fishing any good over there yet? Oh, it's starting to think about it. We're getting yeah. close. Yeah, same same around here. Same around here. Mm-hmm. It's starting to get that way. The fish are doing their thing on gravel, and guys are, there's a few looking up here and there. Guys are doing pretty good on streamers, but I, oh, I don't know. I like to leave them alone this time of year, if, if you can, a l- little bit. Wait for him to start eating those betas real good, and then I'll jump out there and throw my hat in the ring. Yeah, I've, I've kind of decided if I have to wear gloves, I'm probably not going fishing. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I man, I was in Billings on, man, I want to say it was Saturday. I was up in Billings on Saturday, and it was literally some of the biggest snowflakes I've ever seen in my life. It started snowing. I hit snow about Bridger going north. And it was giant snowflakes all the way up to Billings. And then it rained and snowed and was crap all day long. And then Sunday, it was like 65 degrees. Yeah. Yeah. You know what they say? Everything's bigger in Montana. Yeah. (laughs) I thought that was Texas. (laughs) No, Texas is full of shit. Wait, I'm wearing a Texas hat, but Texas is full of shit. (laughs) Oh, I love it. I love it. No, it was, it was crazy, but you're right. It's that time of year. You know, it's, it's kind of like the bird hunting has been over for well, I'll call a month and a half now for us down here in, in Northwest Wyoming. And the fishing hasn't really, I, there's guys doing it, but for me, it's not something I want to go out and get after, but that is what it is. So. Right. Right. But, well, tell us, tell us a little bit more about you. Um, like I said, you're, you are the proprietor at Stonefly Outfitters. You're, I, I guess we could call you a celebrity in the world of fly fishing, but I don't, I don't think, a, I don't think a lot of folks know that. I don't think a lot of folks know that you're a diehard bird hunter. And that's the real reason I wanted to get you on the podcast is dude, you spend all fall after your guide season's over for fishing you spend that with a shotgun in your hand chasing upland birds i do i do i i get asked a lot of times throughout the year if i can guide upland bird hunters or anything like that and you know i politely just decline it's not it's not something that i enjoy doing i do love hunting with with some friends and and buddies of course but uh, that's my time that's it's something that I, you know when the fishing's slow on the big hole in august and the fish aren't biting the I'll row down the river and I'm just thinking about, well, today's another day I'll put under the belt and that's going to pay for, you know, two or three more days out in Eastern Montana, chasing dogs around. And yeah. yeah. It's like a light at the end of the tunnel for me. Sure. And, uh, and quite honestly, it, it's been, I've hunted birds my whole life, but in the last 10 years, um, I think we all go through phases in life and I went ahead and got the midlife crisis over with and, and uh, instead of, <laughs> <laughs> i love it instead of buying a motorcycle i bought a couple of short hairs <laughs> oh geez man and, i don't know uh, i don't know which one goes faster the motorcycle or short hairs. <laughs> and it's just evolved into, into this lifestyle honestly that i don't ever see it changing i really don't it, it's it's so it, it the people you meet and the if i wasn't a bird hunter you and i wouldn't be talking no absolutely absolutely one example and you know that you start throwing in dog training into the mix and all of a sudden you got a whole new line of friends that like the same thing you do yeah and what better way to pass the time really yeah 
No, I couldn't, I couldn't agree more. I know by the time, of course, working, working, you know, wingmen being part of Eastman's, most of our fall, most of my fall spent chasing big game until, you know, November rolls around. And then I get to focus on some of the bird hunting stuff. Um, we are ramping up a sage grouse project that I'm not going to divulge too much about, but it's going to be pretty cool that we're actually going to, I don't know how I, I don't know how I managed it, but I was able to steal a couple days away from out of elk season in September to go do some sage grouse stuff. Oh, yeah. I don't know how I pulled that off, but it, good. I was able to wrangle a camera and the whole nine yards. So oh, wow. that'll, That's that'll be, yeah, that'll be fun. It'll be a neat project. We're planning in the works, but Dude, I couldn't, I couldn't agree with you more. I've been bird hunting probably like you forever. I mean, it's just something yep. that growing up, we just did. And yep. it was the first thing we got to hunt every year in September. And it's just, we hunted rough grouse and woodcock and that was it, you know, and mm -hmm. threw, threw in some pheasant trips if we could, if we could get them. And then man moved out to Wyoming and thought, Oh yeah, my bird hunting probably, you know, that's probably going to get, I had no idea. You know, I knew there was sharp tail and things like that, right. but I had, I had no idea how good the upland bird hunting can be in Montana and in Wyoming. You know, everybody thinks fishing, they think big game, but we have literally have some world-class bird hunting out here and I'm not going to get into spots or get too crazy about it because I want to kind of keep it a little bit of a secret, but <laughs> it's incredible. You can literally start chasing birds in, in September and go all the way into February in Wy Oh, well, yeah. Late January in, in Wyoming. Yeah. Yeah. We shut down January one, but uh, you know, that stuff up North of where you're at pretty, pretty fabulous bird hunting, man. It can you know, be weather. Weather typically drives me out. Um, usually by mid December, it seems like it's getting pretty tr tough to, to put dogs on birds in, in a situation where you're not just shooting them out of barnyards and whatnot. You know, I don't think any of us like that at this stage in the game. Uh, the, the thrill of, you know, hiking behind your dogs is largely dictated by weather. And it more and more, I chase weather patterns, whether it's in Idaho, Nevada, Wyoming, Montana, Arizona, wherever weather seems right. That's where I'm headed. Yeah, no, I, I don't blame you. Are you, so what kind of, le what kind of weather then are you looking for? in that are you looking for clear bright sunny days um there has to be a freeze for sure you know what we get into in a lot of the zones that i i tend to frequent um roads will keep you out of a good area sure, sure. so you're going to want it to freeze that morning for sure um or you're you're likely to get stuck, which I normally do about once or twice a year. <laughs> if you spend any time on the back roads in the West, you're going to get stuck. That's yep. just the way it is. <laughs> Especially when you start hauling dogs and equipment around and you're oh using, boy. A, you're running a bigger rig usually, you know, oh boy, I've, you I know, came. The, the, the interesting thing about that though, Todd, and I didn't mean to cut you off. No man, some go. Of, some of my favorite days have been when plan a is a no-go because you can't drive there mm -hmm. well you know we all like to hunt our zones that we're comfortable in and and you kind of know where the birds live and you got your program and some of my favorite hunts every year are oh shit we can't get into you know secret ridge or wherever right. it is you want to be right no tell them draw yeah yeah <laughs> where we always shoot limits and the birds yes. hold good <laughs> So then you get grumpy and poopy pants because you can't go there and you think, well, shit, and you drive around for two hours and you're out of coffee, but it's not quite time to drink a beer. And you're like, well, let's throw a dog out right here. And, and uh, honestly, maybe even rode him from the pickup. And right. See what, you know, the dogs are barking shit. They want to get out of the truck worse than you do. Right. And man, you, it's endless. You just discover stuff. And that's the fun of it, right? I'm glad I'm not the only one that rodes a dog. I can't do that. Oh boy. A, I can't, I can't do that with the dog I've got right now. Cause I'm just running a lab. Mm -hmm. And so yeah, roading a lab doesn't exactly work. You're just going to, that's just a recipe for watching birds fly off into the sunset. Right. You know, but right. when my, when my dad comes out and, and has his short hair in the past, we've done exactly that. Yep. It's kind of, it's kind of like, the country is so big. It's so vast. And those birds yep. can be absolutely anywhere that the yep. two, the two best things that I've found, and you just hit the nail on the head. One of them is roading a dog or two and just rolling through country and letting those dogs do the work. 
Oh, it's fun. It's- yeah, it's a ton of fun. And you find, like you said, you find a lot of good spots that you would have never found if mm-hmm. you had to walk everything. There's That's just, right. just no way. And we the have other- to manage our time on foot, right? I mean, yep, absolutely. I- I'll go with the best of them, but I'll burn myself out. And, and a lot of times, you know, you find a bird or two, but a lot of times, as soon as you drive the pickup down and around the corner, you're like, well, son of a biscuit. Why didn't we come down here? I know. I know. So it's like, if I'm, if I'm in a new area, I do the same thing, man. I'll roll through country or maybe I haven't hunted something in a while. And I'm not even sure it's holding birds that year. I'll roll through. And what I do, because I'm running a lab, right, it's the only dog I've got right now. Because mm-hmm. most, a lot of what I do in that time of year is waterfowl based. And he's, he's great in the uplands, but man, trying to keep up with a lab hunting chuckers is not exactly a, not exactly a fun experience. That can be a little frustrating. Oh my gosh. And he, and he, hunt, <laughs> and he hunts close, but I can't, mm-hmm. you can't keep up with him. You start scrambling up through the rocks and he's just going. And right. you, you can't keep up with them. You need a dog that points and holds, but uh, you do. Anyway, I use my binoculars like I do sure. hunting, hunting big game. I use them oh, like boy. crazy, man. Mandatory equipment. Yeah. Mandatory equipment. Especially like when there's, there's snow on the ground. Oh, shit. I can't tell you how many hours I spent glass and chucker ridges with a spot and scope. Right. Yeah. Right. Just to find them before you walk your ass clear up into the back country. We for do nothing. it for, we do it for big game all the time we we don't sure. i we would never put a stock on on a bull or a buck or you know whatever without checking him out through the scope first to make sure that's what we're after right. you know why would you go just unless you just like nature hikes right you know taking right. your shotgun for a walk why would you not do that it just makes sense well we've all done plenty of that there's plenty of <laughs> plenty more of that in my future oh sure. I, mine too mine too <laughs> it's like and i've got I think uh, well, we're both dads. I think your girls are a little older than mine, but mine are pretty little. But mine are getting to the point where they can tag along pretty good. Oh, they and, love it. And man, do they absolutely! They love going out and following the dog around. And good grief, we end up bringing back more rocks and shed antlers than just about oh, anything. Oh yeah, of course. And then you got to have your candy and and all your snacks in the truck and all that other stuff. But it all works out. I did a I did a neat thing with my daughter uh, this year. My youngest daughter is ten. Okay. And uh, my most recent pup is a little setter bitch out of Texas named, and I named her Tex. Oh, cool. And, and Katie, my daughter, laid claim on her straight away. That's her dog. And uh, of course, the dog isn't worth a hoot yet. She's just six or eight months old and just a pup. Run. Yeah, she runs like her hair's on fire and doesn't point anything. But <laughs> every now and then, she will. Well. I got a set of radios, hand to hand, uh, hand to hand radios. Yeah. And you know, Katie would go on a walk with me, but those little legs, hell, I'm short. I can barely keep up with Hudge, my hunting partner, but that little kid, she'll go for good for about an hour and she's just done. And a lot of times, you know, we're just getting to the good stuff. Right. Well, you just give her a radio and let her walk back to the truck and she's at the truck and she's call me on the radio looking for binoculars and she saw an elk and dad there's a moose over there and dad i look out i think i saw some birds go over there of course she didn't see anything but yeah that's genius the communication factor yeah now you now you're not worried about your kid sitting at the truck oh shit what's she doing there's loaded guns in there and there's beer and whiskey and what else is going to happen if you got a 10 year old getting into the whiskey man you got problems (laughs) (laughs) They can, they pour it pretty good. I can yeah. tell you that much. <laughs> but man, the rate, the handheld communication thing, it opened more. It, it they love it. They love it. And it, you know what, it's that much. It's the only thing we want to do as dads is take our daughters with us. Right. Oh, I love it. You know, and, and I got a little guy now um, that's six months and he's going to be a terror. He's already given mom fits, but you know, it's one of those things that he's going to be my they're all my little hunting buddies you know my yeah. my, da- my daughters love to go he's gonna love you know that you just it's not like you wait I, I took we did a goose hunt last year last winter and guy eastman calls me the two nights before he's never been on a goose hunt in his life you know mm-hmm. and he says hey i was wondering if if i could if i could go i said yeah absolutely he's like well i got a condition i said what's that he said my daughter wants to go with 
I said, that's not a problem because her, his daughter and my daughter are the same age. And then there's another guy with a daughter here in the office. They're all pretty much the same age. I said, we'll just take, well, three of us will take our oldest daughters. Perfect. Well, there was pink and purple and boxes <laughs> and donuts and screaming. And it, we did it. We did a podcast about it after the fact, and we filmed the whole thing. And it's, it's my, it's my favorite webisode that we've ever done for the, oh, for, I bet. for the series. And I'm biased, obviously, but no, you're not. You're you're being a dad. That's respectful. <laughs> no, it was it was so cool, you know. But I think back. You talk about the radios. I think about I was deer hunting in uh, Region G down in Wyoming in the the south of Jackson, mm -hmm. and that country's just just loaded with mountain grouse, with rough grouse, with duskies. With there's lots and lots of birds there. And of course, bears too, I think. Yeah, no, not that far down. Um, not not where I was, but there's some up closer to Jackson. Gotcha. But uh I came around a corner, I was headed back. It was a, a Sunday afternoon or so, and I was headed back to uh I was getting packing everything up, and I'm driving out this trail on my four-wheeler, muddy, nasty mountain road. I'd been up in the back country chasing deer for three or four days, and I come out, come around a corner, and there's three four-wheelers parked along the side of this two track i didn't think much of it you know well, they're deer hunting i come around the next corner about a quarter mile down the trail and here's this little fella and i tell you what rooster he couldn't have been i don't know he was tiny i mean his 22 was <laughs> almost as big as he was uh -huh. you know and he's got his hunting vest on and lo and behold he's got a grouse slung over his shoulder oh dear lord and i Boy. thought holy smokes you know and this is the middle of nowhere and i stopped and i said you okay buddy he's like yep just hunting birds i said <laughs> okay i said okay i said where's your where's your folks well they're up glassing for deer on the ridge they said as long as i don't leave the road i can i can hunt up and down the road as far as i want i just can't stay on the road <laughs> i said okay <laughs> And he had a little two-way radio on a, on a cord around mm -hmm. his neck. And I said, so that little radio, your mom and dad got it. The other one, he's like, yeah, we, I check in about every hour. Mm -hmm. I said, all right, bud. Well, have a good one. He's like, yes, yeah, uh, I saw some did you, birds. Did you get his name? You're going to be oh. having him on a podcast. Yeah, right. I should have. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I didn't get his name. I just thought I'm like, man, that's how, that's how we grew up. Right. Minus, minus the radios. Yeah. Mom and dad just turned us loose. You know, it was like, go play in the North woods and see if you can bring something home for supper. Sure. Yeah. It, it, the radios make it nice. And you know, let's face it. Being a bird hunter and running bird dogs is not about killing birds. It, it, no. it, that's the last thing that I think about. Yeah. I love to shoot them. And even shoot poorly, you get mad at yourself, but right. At the end of the season, you don't look back on the day when you shot clean you look back on the day where you, where, when you didn't shoot clean and you look back at the what day, the hell, what the hell was wrong with me that day? Yeah. Yeah. And you look back on the day where your dogs handled well and didn't piss your buddy off and didn't piss you off. And you know, those, those dogs are I, to say that it's all about the dogs for me is a complete lie. It's not, it's about me. The dogs are tools and, and I love right. them for it and they get their ass kicked for not following orders and, <laughs> Just a lot like me, you know, I, <laughs> yeah. no different. Yeah. But it's not about killing birds. And when you can introduce your children to it, the shooting a bird is the last thing on my mind. And the girls, my girls know it. They know that I love to shoot birds and they know they're not good enough shots. Neither one of them's killed a bird off a pointed dog yet. They just kills them. They, they've shot cases of shotgun. <laughs> 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 and they think i'm mad because we didn't get them well hell no i'm not mad i think no. it's fabulous it's fabulous Abs absolutely absolutely it couldn't be any better you know and it's running point and dogs of course i made the transition from labradors to now i'm at i think five different breeds or something like that each dog has got its own little personality and own dialect in the way they respond to you and when you're working with your children, they see it. They see it every day. They see it today, March 20, whatever the date is today. I think uh, it's the 23rd. Yeah. My daughters got out of school about 
three hours ago and uh, I picked him up and I had a load of pigeons in the back of the truck and we went and worked dogs with handheld pigeons and I carted a bunch of them and I let the girls fly the pigeons out there and they love it. They, it's something that most kids don't get to do. No, I would, I would completely agree with you on that. Not enough kids get to do it, you know, because, yeah. the, because of the time spent with, with you, the mm-hmm. time spent outside, the time yep. spent with a dog, they're learning, yep. they're learning so much, so much, you know, it's, they, they're, I, I'll bet you they learn more in the hour and a half you were working dogs or two hours you were working dogs mm-hmm. and they learned all day in school. They do. And, and, you know, I, if I could text you a picture right now, I would, but uh, before I left for Belize a couple of weeks ago, my youngest daughter had show and tell she's in fourth grade and she'd been asking me for, I don't know how long she wants to bring texts that set her in <laughs> show and tell. <laughs> Finally, I broke down. I said, all right, let's bring the dog in watching her parade that dog around that fourth grade classroom and letting her, you know, it's a small class. There's only 10 kids in it. But right. Right. Watching her interact with the dog and letting those kids pet the dog and telling the dog to woe up. I, I just stood in the corner. I had tears in my eyes. I'm getting tears in my eyes now. Thinking about it. Was, <laughs> it was just so cool. Oh, and good for you. Learned, she's learned that through, you know, running dogs with me and it, right. it's not always perfect but right. I, I don't ever i don't want a robot i want a dog that has personality yep i and, i couldn't agree more and with your kids involved the dogs have no choice they you know they're eating biscuits on the couch and they're eating their cereal milk in the morning just all this shit that's totally wrong and they shouldn't be doing it <laughs> they do it every We've, day in their i've got another i've got a my lab right now has just turned nine and he's still He's a beast. He can still get it done, no problem. But I tell you what, a couple hours chasing roosters and in thick yeah, grass and whatnot, he gets tired. And then he's done for the rest of the, for the whole weekend. You know, he's he gets right a couple hours for on a, a upland birds and he's done. He can hunt ducks pretty much all weekend if I'm easy, all you know, several days in a row. Yeah, as long as sure, well, as long as I don't, as long as I'm not asking to retrieve 30 greenheads out of a frozen river, you right. know. But right. he's he's getting to that point. So we work in talked to the wife and i said you know we need we need another dog and so got another lab on the way um oh, good probably got a i'm thinking of Brittany after that after i get this other one but i am i've i've had when i got the, when i got the lab i have now i wasn't married and i have and i had no kids and yeah, that changes that, oh buddy <laughs> and that dog that dog's like <laughs> I don't even have to talk to him. I can look at him and give him little yep. signals with my hands and he does exactly what I want. Yeah. I don't yep. think it's going to be like that with the next one. <laughs> Might not be. You know, he's <laughs> he's with all those kids involved. Even my nine-year-old dog, we got out the high chair the other day for the first time to start feeding the little guy out of the high chair. And that lab remembered that from the other two. And boy, he's sitting right there. I'm like, you're oh, not, yeah. you're not even allowed in the kitchen. What are you doing? Yeah, it doesn't matter. There's going to be food on the floor in about two seconds. <laughs> that's exactly He's right. Labrador, you can't help it. Yeah, that's exactly <laughs> right. But you know, and I, and I wouldn't trade it. I wouldn't trade it. He's so good with the kids and, and the kids love having a dog and they're not afraid of other dogs either. And that's a big plus for me. You know, Absolutely. I, I do see people whose, whose kids are real nervous around animals or dogs in particular, it's yep. because they don't spend any time around them. We went Even, to a gun. We went to a gun shop the other day. I was looking for, I don't remember what it was, but went into a little gun shop. Um, and this older fellow that runs the shop, he's got a Rottweiler in there that I bet you weighs close to 200 pounds. Oh, I mean, this Lord. thing's like a bear. It's huge. Uh-huh. And he's a friendly dog. But I told my girls, you know, they're not afraid of dogs. And I told them, I was like, you don't just go up and pet him. I said, he's got a job to do in here. And I said, if he wants to come over, if he, if he comes over to you and is interested, you can pet him, but don't go over there. That's right. Rooster. They stood there like 15 feet away from him, just eyeballing that dog the whole time. They wanted to pet him so bad. Uh Finally, he came over, got up big old boy gets up and he lumbers over to him. And of course he's looking my oldest who's five, just about square in the eyeball. You know, he's so big and he's licking their faces and, you know, his 
his head's as big around as a computer screen, you know? So, but they just, <laughs> they just loved it. They loved it. And having yeah, them yeah. have that inner, that connection with dogs is important to me. I watch grown adults that come to the lodge. You know, my dogs are all in kennels. Yeah. N- not far from where everybody cocktails at night. And, and people will want to go over there and give them steak bites or whatever. And I've got a sign that says, please don't feed the dogs. I mean, the, right. everybody does, but I watch grown adults that, that are afraid of the dogs. They wouldn't even think about going over there. And then we'll be sitting around the fire at night. Of course, people start asking questions about those barking dogs and you just read them. You're like, you've never been around a dog. Have you? You're 50 years old, making a million dollars a year. And you don't know how to pet a dog behind the ear. So I'll go, I've got a little cocker spaniel and I'll get him out of the kennel and bring him over there and just make him sit down. And I think there's pictures of him on your Facebook page. Oh yeah. Old Cinco. He's a good dog. Cinco. Yeah. Yeah. He's he, dog lo- he, looks, he looks like a character, man. <laughs> he is. All my dogs have Mexican names. <laughs> That's awesome. That's awesome. <laughs> it's a little weird hunting down on the Mexican border in Arizona. You start hollering at Pedro. Cinco! <laughs> real freaking mexican comes running out of bushes <laughs> i've had it happen twice oh my gosh <laughs> oh i can't even imagine no i am i, I believe you no i totally believe you yeah down <laughs> down there i think anything could happen that place yeah. is, talk about the it, wild west it's pretty western i had a hunt uh god this is uh season before last a gal I was dating at the time was with me and I'd walked her pretty hard without a lot of results. We didn't find too many birds, a couple of coveys and, and uh, the weather was wrong. It was hot. We got back to the truck and I had a beer and a taco. And I said, I'm going to make another round with a couple fresh dogs. I know there's birds in there that we walked past. She said, I'm not going. I'm just going to sit here and wait for you. I said, all right, well, I'll be back right at dark. And that, that's kind of taboo down on the border. You, you I kind of want to be. You want to be headed out of that country about four o'clock. I, I've, I've heard the same thing from guys that go down to hunt like coos deer and stuff over yep. the, over the counter. Yep. Same thing. T- time to move. Well, yep. shit, I kind of got down in there where I wanted to be and found a cover or two and shot pretty good. And I was feeling pretty good about myself. And uh, I was walking back up and, and Pedro, my pointer, I, six or eight times he pointed and relocated over about a half mile and you know, I couldn't figure out what was going on. I just couldn't figure it out. Well, finally, he held it really nicely. And I, and I got, I button hooked him, got around him about a hundred yards, got down in front of him. And I, I had a Boykin Spaniel at the time walking with me and got in there and there's no birds. I, I'm pretty confident I would have seen the birds. I'm thinking, all right, there's a single Merns in here and he's holding tight. So I let that Boykin go. It wasn't a Merns quail. It was three javelinas that were hidden in the book oh! <laughs> and he locks horns with those javelinas and my god i killed two of them i walked right in there and kicked them and uh i, I shoot a little double side by side 20 and and i got one with each shot and the third one takes off for the hills well, i grabbed both those dogs and leashed them up thought well i'm not gonna let him chase that thing and uh of course i'm catching my breath that it got western I, <laughs> I bet. And uh, I got the dogs on a leash and we're walking up the ridge and there's still maybe 30 minutes of daylight left. And, you know, I get alone with my dogs and maybe the killer in me comes out. I'm thinking, well, it might, this probably gonna be another covey up here on the north side of this ridge. And I look and I'm hollering at Pedro. Not a lot. I just kind of whistled at him. and said, Yeah, sure. Sure. I wanted to cut right. It was time to head to the pickup. And (laughs) there goes a Mexican running across the top of the ridge <laughs> as fast as he could the dog saw him shit they want to go <laughs> oh, no. shit i my pickup is down in the that it's not far from there and the keys are in it and i know that the gal i'm dating at the time is sitting in there sleeping oh my god so gosh. here's a mexican running into a pickup with the keys in it so i run to the top of the ridge and get my phone out call the truck call her and i said hey hey lock the doors and grab the pistol and then i lost service it just went out it was oh not my God. scared the crap out of her oh boy so I, start, <laughs> I, start I noticed i it. noticed you said you were dating her yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> she, she's no longer in the picture 
we could talk for hours about that but oh so I, I start hauling ass for the rig and i thought well shit there's one mexican there's probably about 10 of them so i let both the dogs off the leash come down the pickup and she's outside the pickup with a pistol and i said did you see him she said see who i said there's a mexican just ran right past here i guarantee it <laughs> she said i didn't see anybody I said, well, get in the truck and lock the doors. Let's go. Let's put these dogs up. It's time to get out of here. <laughs> Boom, here comes the Border Patrol agent. And he, he's just cruising around doing what he does. And he pulls up. He, he asked how hunting was and whatnot. He says, you see anything weird? And I said, well, if weird means a running Mexican, there's one right there. I just <laughs> shot two javelinas off my dog. Oh, almighty. God dang. <laughs> He said, I told you before to get out of here before dark. I said, well, I had to walk back to the truck. I had a long way to go. I couldn't help it. <laughs> yeah, if life's not about adventure, it's not worth living, I tell you. No, what. no. And I, yeah, I'm not short on that, I don't think. <laughs> That's awesome. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, I've been trying to talk my dad into going down there. And his short hair now is beyond beyond the age of hunting and i don't i'm trying to talk him into getting another bird dog but i i think he's probably i think he's probably done with a bird dog he might end up with a farm dog to hang out with but uh yeah he's at the point where he's like ah, i don't know if i want to put put that kind of time into another dog i'll i'll just pay and go pay and go with other guys you know he sure I, t I told him i said that's fine but i'm trying to get him to go down there and do that and he's all about it and my mom's like mm -mm, nope not gonna happen <laughs> you're not going down there by yourself i was like yeah whatever i think it'd be fun but um no oh, man alive there's some damn good guides down there if you want to put that together just give me a holler i i I've will been lucky to run around with jared and dave brown and cool man they, they just they know the country and they right. got good dogs and... well that's just it man you you start like he, they he lives in northeast iowa and he's got good pheasant hunting right there in his backyard of course south dakota oh, sure south dakota's right next door this that and the other thing but his dog's right. getting old and i told him i said you need to just not worry so much about maybe getting another dog if you don't want to put the time in but you need there's guides all over the place you can go with whether it's hunting pheasants or hunting down where where you're talking or going to the north woods and hunting wisconsin or minnesota or the upper peninsula of michigan for for rough grouse and woodcock i said good yep. grief Yep. You know, why not yep. pay somebody, I, to pay somebody to take you. Yeah. And, and honestly, Todd, I'm in the business, right? I take right. people fishing Absolutely. for a living. Absolutely. And the mathematics on it are, are so simple, you know, to, to own a good bird dog, a good broke dog that, right. that you right. can trust. Right. That is no less than $5,000. You got 1500 in the dog. Maybe yep. you send me a trainer for a season. There's, there's another thousand there. You got to feed them. That's 200 bucks a month. Exactly. All, all of a sudden you got a dog that shit, he's worth a bunch of money. Right. Right. Well, if you don't have the time. Hey, your time's, your energy, time's worth something too, you know? And these dogs take time. You, oh, buddy. you don't, you don't just put them in the, on the back shelf until November. I mean, you mm -hmm. run them. I run them every day. I'm home. Yep. Well, for for the guy that can't afford that and doesn't have the time a it's not fair to the animal b it's not fair to yourself there are some damn fine upland bird guides that have yeah. dogs you know 10 strings of 10 20 right right go enjoy it and watch how that works and it, and you know for short money the, the most expensive ones are a thousand bucks a day right you go hunt with them for two three days a year uh, i don't know maybe that's that sounds expensive to a lot of people, but I'll pay it. I'll pay well, it all day long. That's just it. And then if you think about traveling, like go to going down where you were talking, Arizona or mm -hmm. New Mexico, wherever you were, West Texas, and you're mm -hmm. thinking about doing some of those hunts, you got to cart all those dogs down there. Oh, you, got boy. The, you got the expense, the time, you got a rig involved. You got There's a lot of stuff that goes into dogs. Oh, and boy. it's just one of those things. It's like, man. You're, yeah. you're not kidding when you, if you can find somebody that that's got it all there and you don't have to worry about it and you just show up and hunt and get to enjoy the show, mm -hmm. that's, that's worth the price of admission for me. Mm -hmm. 100%. And those guides, it, you know, I've never had a problem paying somebody that's earning their money. 
Right. Like I got a guy that ties a, a certain fly that I fish here that I swear makes me a better fisherman. And, <laughs> don't, don't we all have one of those? And the flies are 20 bucks a piece. <sighs> right. They take them an hour to tie. Yeah. What trade skill do you know of where you wouldn't pay a good plumber? A good plumber is 50 bucks an hour. Especially an when... auto mechanic, 65 bucks an hour. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. I will happily pay a guy that's great at tying flies 20 bucks an hour to make me 20 of them right that make my job easier right well uh, you, you talk about that i i know exactly what you mean i i don't guide it to the level you do but i guide a little bit kind of in the summertime I used to guide a lot um mm -hmm. when i when i was a school teacher and had all summer to, to do that but yep. now now with this i guide eh, dozen 15 days of summer and uh -huh. people are like oh you must tie all your own flies i'm like uh nope <laughs> I don't have no, time for that shit. I don't have time uh -oh. for that. If I if I have a choice between fishing or tying flies, I'm going I'm going fishing. 100 percent right. And I That's will pay, right. I will pay somebody. I was like I said, I was in Billings the other day and I, I stopped into East Rosebud fly shop <laughs> and talked to I Rich. Like that yeah. good good shop, good dudes. And I was looking for um a uh, little blue winged olive nymph a, a particular one he had a bunch of them and i bought them all i was like i just oh. I, I just bought the whole bin dude <laughs> well you're that guy <laughs> yeah well <laughs> <laughs> i was i had a box stolen out of my boat last spring and it was all my spring stuff all my oh, all man. my all my tailwater spring stuff you know scuds mm -hmm. and sow bugs and worms and betas nymphs and stuff like that and and it was just a wet, it was just a nymph box like that. So I had all my drives, but there's just, like you said, there's one particular beta nymph that I swear if they're eating betas, that's the bug I'm throwing. And well, text, text me the name of that bastard before <laughs> we get off this. <laughs> I need all the help I can get. Yeah. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll quid pro quo, man. You give me yours. I'll show you mine. Oh man. But no, and it's, it is, it's, it's worth the time I walked in and I come walking mm -hmm. out and my wife goes, so did you get everything you needed? And I was like, yep. And I said, Rich is going to have to order a whole bunch more of that pattern because yep. I think I just cleaned him out. Now, probably not. I'm sure he had a bunch more under the counter that weren't in the bin, but you never yep. know. You never know. So, well, worth, it. so worth it. When it yeah. And when it comes to, you know, to the question of do I, do I take a guided hunt or do I haul my own string down or my one old dog or my puppy or man alive you know i i do not guide bird hunts but i hang out with jared nelson in arizona sure and he he does it constantly he guides up here for me in the summer and then down there in the winter time right and uh you talk about a long day i might there oh man yeah so you take your guys hunting from daylight till three four five in the afternoon and then you got to entertain them at night well, yeah, there's a little bit of that that goes on for sure at dinner. Those dogs need tending to, right? Yes. We're, pu we're pulling cactus. We're doctoring eyes. There's two to four hours a night of just feeding, watering, letting your dogs poop, airing them out, doctoring them up, making sure they're good to go for tomorrow. Yep. And as the, as the customer, you're on your ninth margarita, happy flirting with a hot Mexican waitress that just served you. And they're like, well, where's Rooster and Jared? Hell we're having a good time and they'll come out in the parking lot and there's 20 dogs strung out and they're like, well, are you guys ready? No, no, we're not ready. Yeah. We're, we're, we're they, today's not over yet. No, these bird dogs need tending to. Oh and, man. And, and bird dogs are, are different. You know, I've, I've had, I've had both my whole life. Seems like we always had a lab and a bird dog or two, you know, yep. different, whatever. It's funny. We had. You don't refer to a lab as a bird dog. <laughs> Does my as birdie as you make them? <laughs> oh, and and do, does my does my lab? Is he a good bird dog? Oh, geez, yeah, ab bet. absolutely. You know, if you want you want to find pheasants in a cattail slough, he'll right? find he'll find every single one of them. <laughs> That's not, it's awesome. He will burn that thing down. You know, but but as far as you know, I think you know what I mean. As far as like a pointing dog um yeah yeah, yeah. man they are high performance rocket fueled athletes when and they they go sure. first i don't know how many times my dad has had his short hair to the vet for pulling 
pulling, getting stitches and getting right. They pulled a they pulled a nine inch stick that went in under her ear and all the way down into her chest and pulled it all out, sewed her up. She was back hunting two weeks later. You it's know? something that it's something what the dogs can take too. That it is incredible. It, it never stops amazing me. Your dog's out doing his thing and they come into the truck and holy crap they got a, running with they got that. a toenail hanging off you know and oh, it's like God. i'd be crying like a baby <laughs> are you well, kidding you're, me you're not kidding you're not kidding <laughs> it's it is insane you know you you start hunting them in the snow and they run mm-hmm. by you after 15 minutes and there's blood in their tracks you know and you're like okay come here yeah here. i'm looking things. i'm looking for a puncture wound or a cut or something mm-hmm. when it's like okay it's just a pad is just abraded there. We can fix that up after we get back to the truck, but yep. And it man. doesn't take long where you build yourself a pretty good doctor kit. Yes. It, most things short of a real emergency. I feel like I can probably tend to. Yep. Um, have you, have you seen the uh, gun dog outdoors first aid kits? I have, they look nice. I, they I, are. I don't have one, but they look nice. I I've got one right here. I, I had Alex on the podcast, Alex Lane bell on the podcast a few weeks back. And he, uh, he sent me one. And so it's going to be part of my kit from now on. Nice. But it's nice. sweet. It's sweet. The only thing I think I'll add is probably some quick clot, some yeah. quick clot gauze, gauze, but otherwise, man, there's everything, everything I think you could need in there. And I carry that quick clot in my vest. I bet. In yeah, the back. Because you wouldn't have time if you're out, no. if you're a mile no. and a half from the truck and so, and you get a massive laceration on your dog. Yep. Or you, yep. or you, you got to be able to stop that right now, yep. you know, and, and with some quick clock gauze and a bandana. Yep. You can yep. Take That'll get you that. back to the truck. For exactly. Sure. Exactly. Yeah. It's a challenging deal. I, I packed a dog out. Um, God, I don't know how far we went. It seemed like it was about 50 fucking miles, but <laughs> it was, it was really about 30 minutes. Uh, my boy can got into a porcupine. Oh, it, yeah, it, and it wasn't good. It was really, really, really bad, as bad as I've ever seen it. And I could not hold the dog still and start getting them out with, with Quill. With, and, that, um, and that's like a 20 pound dog. Yeah, you know? he was probably 30, 35, okay. and, and built for speed. He was a healthy little animal. He's strong. And uh, yeah, well, my point is, had I been able to sedate him where I was, I could have gotten the dangerous quills out. He had some around his eyes and some ooh, up in his nose. Ooh, ooh, and yeah. Those, ones are, you, those are the ones that travel. Benadryl, dude. You really? Choke some Benadryl down those dogs, and it just chills them out. I couldn't hold I was all alone. I could not hold the dog down and get the Leatherman out and stop pulling quills. He's biting at me and scratching and right. wanting to go. Absolutely. No, I've had it happen twice since, and my vet here turn me on to that liquid benadryl not the pills it's no liquid yep. yeah, you just choke choke it down their throat and within about two to five minutes they're just chilled out it's like me having a cocktail after guiding right. everything's going to be fine so what so what are you doing with that are you probably using like an eyedropper to put it you down the it. back of their throat yep yep just squirt it right in there give them about 50 cc's and within minutes they're chilled out no kidding yep yep That's it a saved good... my ass a couple times i bet I bet that's a good tip. That's a great you, tip. Yeah, you talk about man, that was something that we had to deal with all the time growing up in the UP, up in, oh up boy. in Upper Michigan. Poor, I hate quill pigs, dude. It was <laughs> it was constant. It was constant. It was like it seemed like every time you went out, and we had oh my gosh, I remember hunting with this with a buddy of mine. He had this giant German short hair, and this is the biggest short hair I've ever seen. Uh-huh. And that that dog would eat porcupines you know and it, oh, didn't, it didn't matter it didn't matter yeah how many yeah. times it didn't matter he'd kill him and he would be so full of quills in the he'd throw him in the back of the truck into the vet we'd go yep they'd sedate yep. him and pull him out you know the last went, the last three seasons i got so fed up with those porcupines um of course around here i'm lucky i there's a lot of them and i usually find one if i go looking for them sure i started uh and especially if you got your daughters with a couple long sticks, you can corral those porcupines and get them in a dog kennel. Oh yeah. Easily. And I'll, I'll just keep one for about a month. They eat lettuce and whatever else you throw right, in there. Right. 
and I'll break the dogs like you would snake training on a porcupine, and it works great. Or so are you? So you're using e collars then? Oh boy, um, you bet. You bet hot. with the porcupine. With right. the porcupine in a cage. Right. They can, so they can't get to him and can't get hurt and can't hurt him. Yeah, I've, I've screwed that up a couple times. <laughs> leave leave him in the cage. <laughs> <laughs> Sound advice. <laughs> Words of wisdom right there. Yeah, leave him in the cage and it works. I, my, none of my pointing dogs will go near them no anymore. No kidding. I get some dogs up from Texas every year from a good customer and run his dogs for him that is usually four or five of them and boy oh boy i they you know those texas dogs don't ever see them and up here they're like well here's something cool i'm gonna try and bite right no it's bad oh, so straight away the first two days i have those dogs i've got a porcupine in a cage and we're working them because they live that's right where smart. the dog right where we're hunting birds yeah every time every day you gotta yep. see them well, that's just it. it. It was, it was different for me because growing up they were in the woods, you know, and they'd be sure, you know, you, you, your dog would slam on the point on a, on a log or a stump. It was like, right? I know, I know what's in there, you know, and uh -huh. slap the leash on them real quick, get them away from there. You know, the dog's fighting because it wants that thing. Exactly. You, know, you learn real fast kind of where they are, but out right. here, I, I, I had that lab I've got now. I, I had him. I think I had him, he was six months old when he got into his first porky and I was living over on the, over in Sheridan, Wyoming. Mm -hmm. So country more similar to kind of what you have up there oh, yeah, where, same where we, where we are here, you know, it's pretty much high desert here yep. and we, it's, so we don't have like sharp tail and things like that. We have huns and chuckers and pheasants along the river, but so I, I take him out and hunt sharp tail and they had a, they had a, a kind of a put and take program on pheasants where they plant pheasants at, from a bird farm over there on all mm -hmm. the, on all the public ground. Well, what a great way to get a young dog on birds. You oh, know, it's great. They Absolutely. Hold, they hold for them. They're out. So we're out there. I mean, I think, I think that bird flushed in, I think I killed about 60 roosters over him that first year. Nice. And he was six months old, you know, but I'll never forget. I wing this, he flushes this bird flies back over my head and I shoot, I shoot it and it sails and sailed down a couple hundred yards into this big plum thicket. And he goes down, runs over there. I'm like, Hey, he's on it. I see him in there and I see him come out shaking his head, like pawing in his face. And, uh -huh. I look, and I look and I see a porcupine going out the other side. I'm like, Oh boy. So I run down there. <laughs> he's got, four quills in the end of his nose that are like they're Perfect. like they're like dangling <laughs> and i reached over grabbed all four went popped him out and i went lined him back up and i went fetch it up he went right back in there found that rooster and brought it out to me and he has not he has not looked crosswise at a porcupine since and he's nine years old now boy that's great and not all dogs are that way nope that's for sure. nope and and that's it's funny because my my wife's you know been around dogs her whole life uh growing up on a farm and and stuff but with him he's the most cautious dog that i've ever been around you know you're we laughing about the food thing and he doesn't have a lot of food drive not like most labs like you said most labs are like you know it's, it's food right. it's it's got down the hatch but he's he's funny man he's super chill super laid back and very very cautious and honestly he has been He's been really nice to own from that regard because he doesn't get himself in a lot of trouble. Mm -hmm. You know, he doesn't go hell bent for leather into a retrieve and impale himself on something or get hung up so on something because he's it's like he's thinking stuff through all the time. It's kind of nice. I think we all could learn something from that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no kidding. Speaking of which, you had quite the fall in November, dude. You were you almost went to the happy hunting grounds yourself. I was, I was right there looking at it. Yeah. I, oh man. I, uh, I wouldn't wish that on anybody. To be honest yeah. with you. If anybody's out there listening that, that thinks that they might have a problem, just go get looked at it. Had I, uh, had the foresight to go to a doctor and say, you know what? I'm just not feeling good. Cause I hadn't been for a while. They'd have probably figured it out. We wouldn't have been, I wouldn't have went down that road, but, uh, I went down it and, uh, you know, it never hurts to have good friends and customers in the medical field. 
and they saved my ass. They really did. My ex-wife saved my ass. Yeah. No question. Yep. Yeah. I wasn't feeling good. You know, I, I went through COVID and that was just like, uh, uh being sick. Uh, and I was sick. We've all been right. there and we don't, we don't right. like to admit it and we don't like to talk about it, but I felt like I felt puny for about two weeks. Sure. Sure. God's honest truth. I hadn't felt real good since August. And I, I mm. had, uh, in my head attributed it to, uh, we had a real smoky year. Oh man. The forest fires. It was bad. Yeah. Water got low and, and fishing w- was fine, but we didn't have any customers because it was COVID. I was right. dealing with a 75% reduction in my normal work, work season on customers. And I just thought, well, I'm just grumpy and, and stressed out and tired. Right. No, my body was telling me I had a problem. And, uh, I woke up one morning and, and clearly didn't feel good. And, and I had thought, well, this is COVID coming back. I'll just, I'll fight through this. So I took, <laughs> I took a Zantac because my stomach was upset. I was burping real bad. Shit, I went deer hunting, went and rattled in a few bucks. Didn't shoot anything. Stopped at the local bar and, and had a couple beers with, with one of the guys I know. And got up the next morning at noon. I, it, which is not me. I'm up at four 35 every day of my life. Sure. And I thought, man, that's a hell of a hangover to have. I something's not right for a couple of beers. Yeah. yeah well, maybe it was 10 or 12. <laughs> <but>. <laughs> now the truth comes out. Now I see it, it was a yeah. shitload of beers. Yeah. <laughs> well, so I had to, uh, I had to run my daughter to the clinic. Um, she was getting thrown out of school because uh, COVID scare or whatever. Sure, sure. My ex-wife looked at me and she said, you look like hell. I said, I'm not going to lie to you. I feel like hell. She said, what's going on? I said, yeah, I can't breathe. It feels like I'm outside. It's cold. And she said, well, let me listen to your lung. So she listened to my lungs and she said, your lungs are fine. You got, you got something else cooking. You better go to the doctor. I said, yeah, all right. I'll go to the doctor. So I drove to the emergency room in Sheridan, Montana and, and parked outside <laughs> Talk to my good buddy Hudge about where we're going to go hunt tomorrow for an hour. And uh, I said, you know what, Hudge? I, I, and this was my tip. There's this one zone where we've been doing real good on hunts and hunting it two, three times a year. He wanted to go back up there. Well, you got to tighten up the boot laces to hunt that country. Sure. And I said, you know what? I, I'm not feeling real good. I, why don't we go down to Three Forks, down that zone I found, a little flatter. He, and you know how good buddies are. He said, why don't you go in and get looked at? Yeah. He said, I, whatever I'm hearing doesn't make sense. Right. So I walked into the emergency room and the doctor looked at me and said, you look like shit. I said, yeah, I kind of, I, I kind of feel that way too. I'm not going to lie to you. <laughs> <laughs> so he drew a little bud and, and uh, shit about five minutes later, he's back in the ER and, and he, he's on his cell phone. And I thought, well, that's kind of weird. And he's talking to the life flight in Missoula. Oh, geez. Yeah. And, and he hangs up and I said, what's going on? He says, you're out of here. I said, well, I gathered that, but what's going on? Yeah, I kind of figured. He says, you've had a heart attack and you're getting ready to have another one and I'm not ready for it. We got to get you out of here. I said, you're shit, man. I have a heart attack. I'm good. He said, no, you have. And my tronopin level, which is this chemical that your heart gives off, was at a... a a very bad level 3.9 man he said i don't think i get the helicopter in here because it's snowing real bad so we're going to put you in an ambulance i said well all right if if you insist so in goes the nitroglycerin in my arm and i said Mm -hmm. like how close am i going to have another heart attack right now he said any second it's coming anytime holy smokes uh, yeah yeah and i was planning on going hunting in the morning yeah so plans are changing by the second somebody call get, hudge somebody call he, hudge i can't make you know, it in the morning i text i text hudge i said i'll be in i'll be in bozeman tonight don't send flowers i'm not dying i'll call yeah, you when exactly I up. holy <laughs> crap so what did they do they like drive you to ennis no we went to bozeman to the uh to the cardio unit which i know that the head cardio guy fishes with me so that was handy yeah and uh i get in the in the freaking well, because and because what I'm thinking is, if you went over the pass between Sheridan and, and Ennis yeah. in an ambulance in the snow, yeah, we that's did. A, that's not a fun drive. No, we did it. I, got you. 
uh, I'll probably break down crying again, but we, uh, we're headed through town and, and I was talking to uh, a good customer of mine named Jimmy Clute, letting him know what was going on. He, he's kind of my life coach where he's a few years older than I am, but we've been through a bunch together. And he was giving me a pretty good pep talk. He said, well, this isn't it. I've seen your end and it ain't in an ambulance. So don't worry about it. Well, about that time, the EMT charges the paddles. And I said, whoa, cowboy. What? <laughs> <laughs> Let's pump the brakes here. What the hell's going on? He says, it's about to happen. Uh, and I looked out the window. There's one little window in the back, and we we're driving past my fly shop. And I said, stop this freaking ambulance right now. He said, what are you talking about? I said, no, stop. I said, you, and you stay with me in case it does happen, but driver run in the house and grab McCall. My oldest daughter's in the house. Here it comes. As you get older, you okay. can't stop from crying when you think nope, about stuff. No, right? this is it's okay. I said, you, you run in there and grab McCall and get her out here so I can say goodbye to her. Dang. Try dude. that on three. Try that on three sides. Uh, I can't even. Right? Man, I can't even I can't even fathom. Can't so even she, fathom that. She came out and opened they opened the back door to the ambulance, you know, it's snowing a little bit snowing a lot and uh she said what's going on dad i said well dude i gotta run to bozeman um i'll holler at you in the morning but make sure the dogs are fed (laughs) (laughs) oh i love you by the way i love you but make sure the dogs (laughs) (laughs) grief dude (laughs) yeah (laughs) oh my gosh so that's how that went down holy crap man live And so yep. you had a heart attack in the ambulance? No, I never had the second one. You never had the second one. No, they gave me enough nitroglycerin to stop okay. a train, and okay, it never it never hit. They they piped me with a stint uh, that night about midnight, and okay, okay, off we went. Damn. I was I was chasing bird dog six days later. I was going to say you were chomping at the bit. I know that. I was <laughs> I was watching your posts on social media going dude, you need to pump the brakes a little bit. And you're like, I got to get out there. I got to get out there. <laughs> I can't sit still. And, you no. know, the, here it is prime pheasant hunting time and, right, and right. shark tail time. And Hudge called. He said, you feeling better? Me and Dale Spartus are headed out the circle. And I thought, man, I'd sure like to go do that. So I called the heart guy and uh, old uh, uh, Blair Herb and Bozeman. I said, Blair, what's, what's the reality? How long have I got to be laid up? And he said, well, how are you feeling? I said, well, I feel like shit, really, but I just kind of want to get outside. I just got to get out. He said, well, don't go do it alone. Um, yeah, yeah. And, and just listen to your body and, and go have fun. Yeah. And shit, I did. I, and honestly, the first day I, I hunted, I, my head was so screwed up. I, I missed a limit of roosters and a limit of Sharpies. And yeah, I bet. God, I'll never, I'll never forget this old Dave's, Dale Spartus, who's a really good friend of mine. Of course, he's a hell of a shot and just a great bird hunter. Dale shot his limit over my dogs and we're back at the camper that night and he's saying well rooster you know we'd gotten into some whiskey <laughs> he says well what do you what do you think what do you think happened and, and you know maybe it's your gun it doesn't look like you're mounting your gun right and this that and the other thing I said Dale I just had a freaking heart attack <laughs> so yeah but my excited. god it's it's the gun it's the it's gun probably the gun I'm so freaking excited to be walking in on these dogs that I'm not just even these, paying attention. These cheap shells I'm, I've been yeah, shooting. Freaking hugs give me rubber bullets. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, and and Dale's coaching me on my shooting, and we're having fun. And you know, the honest truth, I had my daughter with me, and I was trying to get her in some shooting. And, and the next morning, uh, we're getting ready to turn some dogs out. And Dale said, "Well, Rooster, which way are we going?" And you gotta remember, Dale's got a lab with him, and his lab is tired. Yeah, and we're gonna bite off a big chunk of CRP. And, I said, well, Dale, I'll be honest with you. I'm going that way and I'm going alone. <laughs> he said, what? I said, yeah, I'm going that way and I'm going alone. I'll see you back here in a couple hours. Be fine. And I shot it. Uh, here's, here's a radio. <laughs> yeah, take your radio. Well, to the Hudge radio. Took, Hudge took Dale with him and, and that was nice. They had a nice hunt together, but uh, I'll never forget that hunt as long as I live. Uh, McCall and I took took off on a nice little jaunt and I shot a nice limit of roosters and couple of sharp tails that worked out pretty good and uh yeah, that's cool uh, i think there was five or six dead birds in the bag and i shot six times 
and yeah, and just, I think I'm I think I'm looking at a picture of that right here on that was fa- it on Facebook. Yep. Sun, sunset yep. photo and yeah, hey, McCall took that picture. That that's, was that's I awesome. Will, I will never forget that walk as long as I live. And McCall never pulled the trigger. She she was like, Dad, you know what? Just get on in there. And only family knows that. Sure. She knew how bad I wanted it and how bad I needed it. And, yeah, uh, absolutely. I had her run a shuttle for me with the truck and pick me up down at the bottom down there. And of course, she doesn't have a driver's license, but that doesn't matter around here. And she that's said, well, be- what you- that's a beautiful thing about living in the West, isn't it? Right. She said, Dad, what am I supposed to do while you're going over there? I said, well, there's the coyote rifle. There's a magazine clip. <laughs> Drive around, shoot coyote. She said, okay. <laughs> yeah, exactly. All right. I'll be back. Yep. Off she went. She shot a coyote and spotted a big batch of birds that we got into the next. Oh, nice. Nice. It was outstanding. But walking up to the pickup with a vest full of birds and there's your daughter there that. Yeah. Nine days before that, nine days before that, I said, kid, I, I might not be around in the morning. Make sure the dogs are fed. Yeah. No kidding. And here we're up. That old country song, feed Jake. No, don't 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 get me started on that song dude i tell you what (laughs) i tell you what oh dude that is a that is a story i mean at the end of the day to all you listeners out there i'll tell you one thing that my cardio cardiologist told me if i didn't hunt birds and chase bird dogs i'd have died in my sleep he said because your heart's so strong your other uh, arteries and and everything was taking care of itself yeah had you been out of shape that you'd have been life out you had a 99 percent block blockage in your right myocardial myocardial artery holy smokes that would have been it yep but because of this sport that's drawn you and i together and hudge and i together and dale right. and I together and all these right. great people right because of that sport i'm a healthier person yeah so when people say oh god you just hunt birds how can you shoot those little birds it's a way bigger picture than that, man. I, mm, you're not kidding. Mm. Nope. We laugh about it all the time. I've still got, I've still got some some goose decoys in a in a blind down here on the river that I, we got a big blizzard down here and I couldn't get to them after season was over and then it got muddy and I could yep. still couldn't get to them and I figure, man, I've got my work cut out for me hauling those suckers up out of there. Damn but, right you do. But it's going to be good exercise, you know and. Yeah. And then you, you factor, you throw in the big game stuff and hunting yeah. as hunting in general as a lifestyle and, and, you know, and, and rowing clients down the river in the summertime, you yeah. know, and it, you just want to keep track of your, of your fitness levels, throw a Fitbit on your wrist and as you're rowing people down the river and see how many, see how many calories you burn throughout the, throughout the course of a day. Oh yeah. You know, yeah. it's being, there's hey, we've a lot, all lot got- to be said for being active. Yeah, we've all got Onyx maps on our cell phones now because we're yeah. trying to figure out how to hunt someplace faster and better than everybody <laughs> else. But um, you can set that track track yep. line on it. Yep, and it'll it'll record it and total it. And uh, after the heart attack, I walked 720 miles. Good for you, man. Right. Good for you. I know. I know people that don't walk that in a year. Who the hell does that? Well, guys that own bird Roos- dogs. Rooster. Yeah, exactly. Guys that own bird dog. Do Good grief. But that, you know, maybe that's... My, maybe my Texas buddies don't do that. They drive 720 miles. Yeah. Well, we go and go back to what we were talking about, about roading the dog through a piece of ground. You don't have to feel too bad about it because once that dog hits birds, you're going to be, you're going to earn it. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You're going to earn it. Yeah. And it's like, I, I think about there's an old mine, um, mine area that's all reclaimed well i guess it's i guess it's a oil field area that's all been reclaimed and it is holy smokes is it it's incredible chucker ground oh but man if you walk that thing and there's because there's roads going all through it and if you walk if you if you walk that thing it'd take you a month to walk all those roads and figure out where those birds are but if you go drive through it first and go okay there's birds in that draw okay there's yep. birds in that draw you get put a guy at the head of that draw and two guys go up the bottom with the lab or whatever you got with you, you can be pretty effective and, and kill some birds, but well, it's you're going to get your exercise. Yeah. 
and in any any sport that we do, whether it's fly fishing or big game hunting or bird hunting, a little scouting goes a long way, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Take a look around. You know, it, I get I'm I'm as antsy as anybody. I said, let's get out and go, but it seems to always pay off if you take your time and look around and make sure you're going the right spot. No, I think I think you're spot on with that one. Holy smokes, there's so I think that's a you could apply that to life too. Take your time, wow. look, take your time, look around a little bit. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like oh, a, a, a good customer of mine, my, probably one of my favorite bird hunting buddies, Mike Pepper from uh, uh, Wichita Falls, Texas. He's got a saying, he says, you know, rooster, every pause in a conversation is a great opportunity to shut your freaking mouth. And boy, he's right. Take it a little slower. You don't have to be the smartest guy in the room what's that get you get you nothing that's pay that's, attention to what's going on man that's a mouthful right there holy right? smokes yep 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 sure. absolutely absolutely well on that note <laughs> <laughs> dude we need we need to get together and run some bird dogs i know we talked about doing it this last fall and it just didn't have a chance to work out but we don't live that far apart and no nope. done we, deal we need to make it happen. So done deal. I've, I've never put a dog on the ground in Wyoming. So I'm coming to you. Come on down. Come on down. We've got some pretty good stuff and that'll give me a reason to, to get my kids out and scout even more. Look around. Sure. Yeah. But, we'll bring the kids with us for sure. Yeah, man, that would be cool. That would definitely be cool. But rooster, thank you very much for your time. I appreciate it. Thanks for, hey. thanks for being on and talking birds and for the wisdom and just having a yeah. good conversation. I don't think I don't, I've, I don't think I've laughed this much on a podcast in a long time. <laughs> I don't know how much wisdom there was, but <laughs> this in there, it's in there. You just got to listen for it, right? I, I hope so. <laughs> it's one of them things where nobody likes to hear themselves talk because you think you sound stupid. If I listen to myself talk, I'd never talk again. Well, I tell you what, you go back and I listen to the. I have to go back and listen to these podcasts and for some of this stuff and i'm like man do i really sound like that right you gotta right. be kidding man i don't want to talk yeah. anymore <laughs> no, we're, we're lucky individuals you know i think about it every day every every time i wake up every time i load dogs up and and uh, i can't lay claim to this but i'll leave everybody everybody with a little little more wisdom my good buddy hudge uh we was down in southern idaho this year and, and uh, one of my favorite dogs got not in one but in two snares oh and, uh, geez yeah had it not been for uh garmin collar i you know your dog's on point so you, you walk in there well shit she's not in point she's stuck in a snare was she, did she yeah. fight did she fight it at all or would she just chill thank god no it killed her oh absolutely but she's an old dog and she's nine and been there and done that and and uh, she just kind of hung tight but we got back to the truck and he had a nice little round and had two or three huns in his pouch and i of course didn't have shit like i normally don't and loading up my dog and and i brought the two snares with me so if you're the trapper that's listening to this sorry i took your snares so i can show my buddies how to release a snare there you dog. go there you go but we got in the truck and and he makes a couple cocktails we've got about a 30 mile drive out of the back back country and we we're talking and and uh the old hudgy says you know anymore if i got a bird or two in the hand and my dogs are healthy and I put them back in the truck. That was a pretty damn good day. And I want everybody to remember that. Uh, that's sound wisdom, man. I, I couldn't yeah. agree with that more. No, that is, yeah. that is spot on. I love yep. it, but it, it's I'm going to ask you, truth. I'm going to ask you a question that I've been trying to close out the podcast with when I got guys talking about birds, whether okay. it's, whether it's waterfowl guys or upland guys, turkey guys, no matter what it is, um, if you could only hunt one bird one way for the rest of your life, what's it going to be? Oh, don't put that evil on me. I know, right? I, I know. <laughs> most of the most of the waterfowl guys are like mallards and flooded timber. Yeah, almost, that's pretty almost, fun. Almost every single one of them. That's pretty fun. But the upland um, guys have kind of been all over the place, so I'm interested to hear what you're going to say that's because it's, it's, it's dictated by mother nature and you don't know what kind of hand she's going to do you it. Can I get a condition forecast? We got an inch of snow. <laughs> you just got to pick, you just got to pick man. <laughs> one bird, <laughs> one bird, God almighty with a point dog. 
Chuckers. Yeah. Yeah. Chuckers in the worst country you can imagine. Because it's more challenging. It's like the permit of fly fishing. That is yeah, well put. I, I'd rather have one chucker that that held for a point and my dog made a good retrieve than a limit of roosters that you know you knew you were gonna shoot them because there's a cattail patch and it was icy and that's where they all at. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Chuckers. They're the king, man. They are the king. They'll they'll man. test it. Everything you got, they'll test your rig, your truck, your trailer, your dogs, your boots, your sanity. And are you up for the test? No, it's up to you. You can figure it out on your own. But that, you know, I, I'm 50 years old, and uh, I don't know how much longer I'll be able to walk Chucker Ridges. So I, I walk twice as many now, just to make up for it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's that's one thing that when I didn't I didn't get to hunt them until we I moved to this part of Wyoming. And we have, right. we have lots of them and they, are, they do, man, they live in some of the nastiest gnarly country. Right. And I don't know about you, but I won't hunt them. I won't hunt them. A lot of guys will start them right in October. And I'm like, I'm not putting a dog on the ground. There's a couple of reasons. One, I'm, we're, I'm so busy doing big game stuff at that time. But yep. the biggest reason is I don't know. I'll put my dog on the ground when there's still rattlesnakes out. Yeah, that's a bit. <laughs> You know, and you get in those rocks where those chuckers live. That's snake country that time of year. And yeah, yeah. Chucker season starts November 1st. There you go. There you go. And I had two. I tried to go early last year. One day I thought it was right. No, I had two dogs bit in October. No kidding. No (laughs) kidding. Yep. Yeah. They're, I'm, yeah. I think if I think I'm, I'm with you on what far as Western Upland, Western Upland birds, the chuckers, man, they are, they get under your skin. They do, and Huns are Huns are right behind them. They're right. They're a damn close second, right? Yep, but they're a lot of chuckers fun. Are, chuckers are the king, man. They're, you feel they're like the, you accomplish something when you kill a chucker or two. You know, you're like, oh yeah. you're looking at that bird going, man, I, I earned that thing. Well, if, if you, and, and I, I'm far from the Zen master of bird dog guys and bird hunting. I just do it a lot. So by default, I learned some stuff. And the only bird I've never shot a, fair and square limit on is chuck really yep really no kidding i've come i've come close i've missed the limit but i've never put eight in the back and you know what i hope i never do yeah yeah what do you do after that well the limit wyoming's i think it's five so okay we'll have to get you down here and see if you can kill five of them (laughs) 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 not a montana limit but hey yeah they're the king uh, you made me pick there it is it, they'll probably be the death of me i'll die on some some rock slide ridge. some wind blasted trucker ridge yeah yeah and with they, a dog on point so. yep yep exactly and they're up there laughing at you doing that chucker cackle that they do oh boy oh, uh, they're boy. fun oh that's cool now rooster thank you again i can't i can't uh can't express my gratitude for you jumping on with us this has been a lot of fun and i'm looking forward to actually getting together and doing some either some fishing or some hunting one of the two count on it one way or the other all right man well i'm gonna stop recording